Hello and welcome back to another episode of Critical Reactions with your host Brian. We're going to continue on with this week's theme of short songs, looking at tracks no longer than three minutes long. And like the rest of this week, we're going to be looking at two songs from this artist, being able to compare and contrast how they approach such a short time limit or time frame. I don't know if they limit themselves on these or if it's just how the song plays out. Anyways, we're looking at a band called Iris.exe today, which I'm going to assume is electronic music of some sort. We're going to start off with Disaster Girl from the album of the same name, which came out this year. And then we're going to jump back a couple of years to the album Smile to see how they kickstarted that album. So let's dive into Disaster Girl and see what Iris is bringing to the table today. Bassy sounds. Okay. That rhythm being shared by like all four instruments here. This is some crisp production. Yeah, I quite enjoyed that. That's my kind of electronic music. Uh, the production is just so crisp, so clean. The timbre choices are electric. They all have such an energy to them. Even just the bass kick, which you're like, dude, it's a bass kick. Like, how much work can you put into it? No, dude, this bass kick is phenomenal. I don't even know that it's really a good analogy of a bass kick it fills that role of a lower rhythmic uh single note but it has elements to it that feel more like a plucked string than than a, than a hit drum head there's almost a part of it that feels like popped and that's what it is it's a popped electric bass that's what it feels like but it's a single tone and that's why I, I had mentioned early on, um, it has a bounciness to it. And it really comes in where the note itself is at the loudest. It kind of hits, as far as the volume goes, it rises up and then there's like a little like hook at the top. Uh, instead of being, you know, a, a perfect curve, there's a, there's a little hook at the top and it's just... Oh, it just has this electricity to this energy. It it just drives. It it pops. Honestly, it's uh, it just sounds so 
good and it's little little decisions like that little details in the production of, of how everything sounds that really speaks to me it's it's the thing that electronic music can really bring to the table when you're not starting from uh any specific ground level like if, if you're crafting a guitar tone you do have the tone of your instrument that you're going to be manipulating you can't really change that unless you change your guitar body or your pickups or your strings or stuff like that but at the end of the day it's still going to be a, a guitar there's a specific uh element to uh picking a guitar string that is going to be present in your tone you can try to get away from that uh what is it Black metal and uh, shoegaze with their tremolo picking and heavy effects put on it can get rid of the attack itself so you just get the texture but molding that is going to be really difficult because what you've done is sort of smoothed over it's like using the smudge tool in in photoshop or or your photo editor whatever you choose to use yeah you're getting rid of the details but also, without details, what are you crafting? <laughs> so, uh, at least to me, it's more difficult to do that. Whereas electronic music, you're starting from wherever you want to start from. You get to make the sound rather than mold it. And it just affords so much expressiveness if you choose to go that route as a producer. And bass kicks like this, that definitely fill the role of a bass drum but kind of don't feel like a bass drum is exactly what I'm talking about it's such a cool little decision and to me it drives a lot of this song just that tone by itself but there's other elements of the production too that stand out to me such as staging where do all the instruments sit how far away from the listener do they sit rock and metal tend to be a bit closer to to the head especially your 2000s rock and metal it's just very compressed very claustrophobic sounds um, once we start looking at like 2010s 2020s alternative metal especially anything that's more in the the mainstream spotlight you're gonna have very large open sound spheres this pushes all of that to the absolute peak there are sounds that feel so distant from me, but they're so crisp and clean. I love that. There's so there's so much spaciousness in here. There's there's well at our peak we have a ton of layers going on, lots of things happening, and yet it never feels cluttered. Nothing ever feels like it's stepping on another instrument's toes. There's plenty of room for everything, and a lot of that comes from this very large sound sphere. Uh, individual production too. L look at the vocals. I think this is a vocaloid. I could be wrong. This could be highly processed natural vocals, but it's getting really hard to tell, right? Vocaloids have come a long way, and especially when you start putting all these effects on it anyways, any chance of uh, the natural tone and and waver and and all the natural components that go into singing they're going to get smoothed over anyways so like i said this could go either way i think it you would need to have a really really good ear to be able to tell if this is a digital voice or a digitally produced natural voice regardless though i love all of the attention to detail on the production side the way that the tone itself has a little bit more human quality some wavering here and there of pitch where in other places it's just a flat line perfectly in tune as if using some sort of uh, uh what are they called a pitch correction tool or in the case of a vocaloid just telling them to sit on the notes <laughs> Um, and so we kind of move between little bits of vibrato and then just perfect, almost synth-like vocals. We have these wild uh, rising and falling pitches, almost as if using a pitch wheel to just gradually de-pitch or rise the pitch of it, getting all the microtones in between in a robotically smooth movement between pitches, something that... I mean, humans can kind of do, but not as smooth as this. 
Um, we have the massive pitch down vocals towards the end of the track, about a minute 40, minute 50. With the, uh, the really low one coming in here. And, uh, yeah, it's all these, these little changes. Um, syncing up the, uh, a synthesizer behind the vocals to give them that extra synthetic uh, feel to them, the, the, the timbre layering that we have in those moments, while in others giving the vocals a, a clear shot. It's all these little decisions that I think elevate it, that from moment to moment there is something brand new to listen to, even if that isn't what the composition says. Maybe the composition is the same loop for 30 seconds, but what's in the music, what gets produced is just this constantly changing idea. The song doesn't really go through sections as much as it feels like it naturally evolves through itself. And that's just, I find that to be very enticing. It's one of the strengths of electronic music. And I think I've said this way too many times in the past, but it's really what draws me to it. Electronic music has no bounds. Why would we create electronic music that feels like something you could create with normal instruments that just have a, a you know a digital edge to them? I don't have anything against EDM for the most part, but it really feels like it's it's a, a limit it's limiting what the format can do. And sometimes it's good, right? We, we don't need every rock guitarist to be a virtuoso. Sometimes you just need to craft a really good atmosphere to go with your vocals. Is it the best, the, the most that you could do as a guitarist? No, definitely not. But it works for the song. So as usual, you know, it's, it's tools in a toolbox. But when it comes to my subjective taste, if I'm going to listen to electronic music, I want to find something that it can do that no one else can. And something like this track right here is that there's so many neat little ideas in here that yeah structurally it's a pop song sonically it's a pop song but in the minutia in the details yeah there's so many ideas here that would be very very difficult to pull off outside of electronic music maybe even impossible in some cases to do the exact way such as those really smooth uh, vocal pitch shifts and that's that <sighs> That's just candy to my ears, man. That's a weird phrase. <laughs> um, here's another cool thing, right? There's a lot of layers in here. While this is a pop song, generally speaking, I think, as far as production and even sort of composition in a lot of places, it ends up being very complex by the end in a way that I think a modern audience might like, but probably wouldn't naturally gravitate towards. Because it does kind of hide some of this. There is the vocals that sit on top and the beat, which is very prevalent. And I think your average listener might just key into those and be happy. But there are some sections that get quite chaotic with layers. But I like how the song has this diaphragm element to it, where it breathes in and gets larger and there's so many ideas going on at any one time and then it exhales and finds this singular vision which is the chorus we might have sections that are a bit more complex but the chorus kicks in and everything is on the same rhythm and that rhythm is very punchy it's a lot of staccato hits very short attacks without a lot of uh, held notes in it and that creates a lot of space in it and this space you can feel. Part of that I think is the production most likely where they can chop off any lingering trails or tails on the, uh, the notes and really ensure that there is no sound in these pockets at all. And it makes it feel very digital, very choppy. This is not natural at all, but there's also something very infectious about this, about having that space against the sound dead silence against everything coming in at the same time and the quickness that we bounce between these two and the rhythmic playfulness of it as well bringing in those dotted notes to kind of shift up the time feel in the chorus it is absolutely lovely to listen to and again it just brings this electricity this energy to the track this time though rhythmically again production plays a little bit into it with shaping all of the sounds to ensure maximum silence in the gaps but 
yeah, the rhythmic elements, everything forming together, this is all compositional. And I absolutely love that. It just, it's such a good chorus. It, it has a strong hook. There's a nice rhythmic flow to it. Um, and of course, everything's in on this rhythm, which really sells it. But it also is just, it makes you want to move. It's an earworm that's also groovy. And I mean, that that's what you want out of a pop song, isn't it? Or anything poppy, I suppose. I don't know if you would call this a pop song. Um, the line kind of blurs for me where pop and electronic are separate. It made more sense in the past, but now most pop music's electronic, and a lot of electronic music's very poppy, especially when you have vocals in them. So, yeah, I don't really know where the, the division lies between those two. Um... Is there anything else I wanted to bring up on this? I mean, the plethora of sounds. Uh, I've mentioned that before on electronic tracks. It's one of the affordances you have when you don't have to worry about who's going to play what. All you have to do is hit the play button after you've programmed it. So you can put as many instruments as you want in there. And we do get to hear quite a few of them. And just like the drums, they're all tweaked for maximum energy and direction and uniqueness to them. So... I'm going to hit some lyrics here, and then we'll check out OK Pixelate, and maybe there'll be some things that I wanted to talk about here, but might fit better to discuss both songs. This song appears to be about a relationship between the protagonist, or I don't even know if we can say protagonist, the narrator, uh, which is the disaster girl, and the person who they're abusing. And abuse might be the wrong word here. There are some implications that the other person is consenting to this relationship, but being that it comes from the person who seems toxic, that might not be something to take at face value. For instance, the very first stanza says, Calm down. It's not right. No alarm telling me to sit tight. You said you're tired? Yeah, you look fine. Never mind that I'm holding too tight. Definitely uh, suppressing this other person, putting down any concerns that they have brought up. It doesn't seem like there's a, a power balance here. But each of the verses also ends with it's not really like you to write off everything that excites you. So it's possible, maybe... However, this also seems that the other person does not seem too happy with the current situation, and our narrator is dismissing that because they've never had a problem before, which is also not really great. And we get to the chorus, which says, um, You'll never leave, I'm your disaster girl, like sugar between your teeth or neural atrophy. I'm chewing on the nerve. I keep it short and sweet, tight and on a leash. It's what you deserve. This chemical kind of feeling that you won't believe. I'm your disaster girl. So yeah. It's about control. It's about uh, dopamine. There's this bittersweet element that this relationship is good when it's good, but also very restrictive when it isn't. And that's pretty much what the song is. We hear this chorus four times, and the verses are rather short and kind of sit on the same topics there. So, how does that go with the song? I don't know, man. I don't think, I don't think there's much of a synergy here, other than the song being very sweet too it is something I, I really liked listening to but i wouldn't really say that there's a negative element to the song that ties into the feeling of being held too tightly uh, being kept on a short leash having this uh, chemical kind of feeling which i believe is is the dopamine it's the positive elements but also the fact that you'll never leave and also the narrator uh, dubs themselves a disaster girl, which is usually not uh, a good description. <laughs> so, yeah, I don't know. The song is just good to me, though, every moment of it. So I don't really know any way that uh, I would say that there's any thematic crossover between the two. All right. Next up, we have OK Pixelate. 
And like I mentioned, this comes off of an album two years prior to what we just listened to. I'm really curious what's going to go down with this. So it was those quick uh, hitch ups on the sides. Really quick beat, pedal tone on the bass. the glitch in the vocals. I love the bubbly textures on the outside. We got the compressed white noise as a snare on two and four. That chorus has a lot of pop rock vibes to it. the dotted quarter on that descending line on the right. There's like four vocal tracks here. Two center, one pushed out on the other side. The one over here is more high-pitched digital wine. Over here it's warbly. Oh, that half step drop. So, this is the same chorus, but with the break beat rather than the simplified rock beat. The bass is coming in hard. Final chorus has the original music behind it. Hmm. I think I'd have a different reaction to this if I hadn't had just listened to Disaster Girl. In fact, I kind of wish I had listened to them in reverse. Not necessarily to show any type of growth. I think both songs are attempting to, to, to do two very different things. But I do find that I enjoyed OK Pixelate, but only because it is a pop rock song done through Electronica, which I find interesting. I just got done talking about how that typically isn't what I come to electronic music for, but it works. It, it hits a part of my brain that just it clicks. So, yeah, I mean, as usual, I'm full of contradictions. We're human, right? So, but I, I do, I think it would have been really cool to listen to a semi-standard approach to composition with a digital uh, veil on top of it and then have moved into Disaster Girl with this full-on uh, wild, eclectic, toss a bunch of digital stuff in their approach. Because um, like I said, the other way around, I found something I really enjoyed, something I don't think I could have heard anywhere else, and then I went into something a bit more uh, standard. And so they're doing two different things. It's not fair to compare them, but listening in close proximity like this, that's what brains do. It would have been nice to have a sort of palate cleanser in the middle here. But that's not how the format works, so... What is this song doing? We have a fairly straightforward vocal melody on top of digital drums 
we have a bass kick that sounds more like a bass kick. It doesn't have that cool bounciness that we heard in Disaster Girl that sounded more like popped bass strings. Um, and we had a, a chip tune, white noise kind of thing for a snare hit. And the bouncing back and forth between these two either gave us more of a rock beat, having the white noise on two and four and some syncopated bass kicks around that, or highly syncopated, quick moving back and forth between the two of them in syncopated rhythmic fashion, utilizing primarily 16th notes, giving us more of a fast-paced break beat. That's our percussion. We have the vocals on top of that, and then usually some sort of synth stuff around that, either harmonically or melodically. There are a couple of areas where we have these ornamental ideas. I mentioned at one point, and I can't remember when it was, I think it was the second verse, there was this uh, descending like waterfall, chirpy, chiptune kind of thing going on. I think it was over on the left side. Uh, there's little things like that, but they're utilized, they're used more sparingly than we heard on Disaster Girl, which was more interested in layers and ornamentation and uh, you know single-use uh, little lines. And so this one ends up feeling quite a bit more straightforward. We also hear a, I don't want to say a rigidity to the vocals, but they're not as dynamic as they were on Disaster Girl. This goes for more of a straightforward delivery. There's a couple of modulations to it, particularly we saw one there at the end with the pitch down, but for the most part, the core vocal is just very normally delivered, probably a bit of production on it, pop style vocals. We do get some addition to this though. I mentioned, I think it was the second, it was the second verse, wasn't it? We had two of those more standard vocals in the center, layering up, kind of giving us a bit more width to it. Then we had one off to the left that was sounded like it was pitch shifted up an octave. And then one off to the left, which was pitch shifted above that even, I think. And then a massive warble put on it too. And the layering of all this, plus the spacing of it, the staging on this song is still really great creates this uh, wild texture layering also being surrounded by the vocals which I think would have been a cool effect on Disaster Girl given that the song was about being overwhelmed by uh, the narrator uh, about how they were you know controlling and and never let go held on so tight the idea of being surrounded by them would have been a very cool thing to add to that song but we get it in this one instead and um, I think it's a very cool technique and it sounds wild it's just so many little little digital tricks going on and again like i said the spacing the staging on it sounds so good and all the music that sits in between it the vocals are pushed pretty far away and the instruments are between them and you the listener and it just sounds fantastic um but then uh you know i mentioned that we have harmony and melody primarily on the instrumentation. We get to the chorus, and while there are some ornamental ideas, there's also a lot of chordal movement here, which we don't really hear too much of on Disaster Girl. This is more of a standard style of composition. Not to mention that on the first verse, we also have the bass guitar instrument, or the bass instrument, just giving us root notes, constant eighth notes on, on the root tones, and moving along with the chord progression. I don't want to say that OK Pixel is a worse song. Like I've mentioned several times, it's just doing something totally different. But again, it's it's about context. Disaster Girl did so many cool things, and then we get to OK Pixel, and it simplifies things. And that doesn't mean it's worse. It's just I was I my expectations were put really high. <laughs> oh man, but I like both. I like both tracks for doing what they do. Um, and you know, I, I, I kind of have a soft spot for electronic pop rock and pop emo. Um, you know, in my album of the year video for last year, Rez was in there with the album It's Not a Phase, which was just a phenomenal album of a bunch of emo and screamo sounding songs done through the lens of electronic music. 
So, like I said, I have a soft spot for this. OK Pixelate works really well for me, but Disaster Girl tickles my brain in a way that only electronic music can do, and it's what I look for when I'm searching for new and interesting electronic music. So they're both good at, at doing what they do. I did want to bring up one thing, though. I completely forgot to bring this up for Disaster Girl, and it didn't pop up at all in OK Pixelate, and it kind of presented a void for me. I don't think every electronic song needs it, but Disaster Girl had phenomenal use of sub-bass, particularly even for transition ideas. And I love sub-bass rumble. You don't really get too much of it in rock and metal. It is something that electronic music does phenomenally with really hitting those low frequencies and making making your brain rumble. And uh, there are a couple of really cool moments in Disaster Girl that that utilized those, used them. And we didn't really get to hear too much of that in this. But again, this was more of a straightforward, almost rock track in a lot of places. So it makes sense that it would have been that it wouldn't have been present in this one. I'm going to find some lyrics for OK Pixelate, and then we're going to wrap this video up. This is a song about becoming numb to your situation, your circumstances of being overly stressed out to the point where just turning off and shutting down is the best thing you can do. Uh, it says, everything got in my way, I've been thrown in, I've been thrown in the trash like I've done wrong. I've lost myself. The, the chorus says I'm overstimulated, locked jaw, deprecated, turning upward at the corners of my mouth, a smile so grossly simulated, force manipulated, slipping further to the blur, and I'm pixelated. The idea of shutting down so much that you just kind of become, you don't have a face anymore. It's just a blurry idea, and then taking this to the digital presentation of that is a pixelation. And of course, that goes with the uh, rhyme scheme of stimulated, deprecated, simulated, manipulated, pixelated. So we get to keep that, that uh, syllabic thing going on. And I like that. The general flow of the chorus works really well from that perspective, and I think it all talks about... Uh, in, a, in a good way of somebody slowly losing themselves. Even says that the smile I put on my face, it's not real. I put it on to get by as uh, a social convention. You're supposed to smile at people, so I do, but I don't feel it. I'm just a blur. We push this forward into uh, the next verse says I'm faceless you could trace my outline and find the gray and find the space between you and my safest all in places utilizing the color gray as a sort of neutral not good not bad just numb the facelessness is the loss of identity yeah Pairing this back to the music, though, again, I don't see any strong correlation between the song and the lyrics, although I do think it's interest interesting that whereas the first track felt very iris.exe, this is my introduction to them as an artist, and I found some really cool, unique ideas in there. This song feels like electronic pop rock, which in the 20, uh, 2020s has been kind of taken off. So it feels less identifying to them and more general, which I think it's interesting the song is about becoming less of myself and more of a anybody. I don't think that's necessarily what they were aiming for, although if it is, that'd be pretty cool. But yeah, I mean, that's that's it's kind of lining up with some of the things I felt while listening to this. All right, so those are my thoughts. Iris.exe's Disaster Girl and OK Pixelate. What did you think of these songs? Is there anything that stood out to you? Anything you'd like to add on to what I said or correct me on? Maybe you heard something I didn't and would like to add to the conversation. Put all that stuff down in the comment section. Above that, in the description box, you'll find a link to Linktree. It takes you here. You can find links to my music, ways to support the channel, a link to the Discord server, and so much more. 
Above that, if you could, like, subscribe, and ring the bell. I greatly appreciate all three of those. That wraps it up for this one, but we do have a special selection coming up next. Otherwise, I'll be back tomorrow to finish off this theme's week. This week's theme. Until next time, remember to be critical, not cynical, of the music you listen to, and have a fantastic morning, afternoon, or evening, whenever you choose to watch my videos. Thank you.